Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Evan Blake. I'm a writer for the World Socialist website and a member of the Socialist Equality Party in the United States. Today, we're joined by Dr. Anthony Leonardi, who is a T-cell immunologist who received his PhD at Kingston University in London and is currently working on a master's in public health. We're also joined by Dr. Benjamin Mateus, who is a clinical physician and our lead writer on the pandemic for the WSWS, who has built up an extensive knowledge of many aspects of SARS-CoV-2. I wanna begin by reviewing the present state of the pandemic and the spread of the Omicron variant. On the screen here, we see Omicron and Delta showing the high degree of mutations on Omicron, which Dr. Leonardi will speak on further in his report. Over the past two weeks, it has become clear that we have entered a new and far more dangerous stage of the pandemic. Omicron has now been sequenced in at least 63 countries and is spreading exponentially in South Africa, the UK, and Denmark. It is forecast to become the dominant variant globally in the coming weeks under conditions in which the sixth global surge has already been underway since last month due to the rapid spread of the Delta variant throughout the Northern Hemisphere. The situation in South Africa portends what will happen internationally as Omicron spreads, particularly in the underdeveloped world. Daily new cases have risen from an average of 420 to 15,466 in just the past three weeks. The test positivity rate remains highly elevated throughout the country at roughly 30%, meaning that thousands of cases go undetected each day. The response of the corporate media and official scientists has been woefully lacking, in particular their neglect to acknowledge the airborne nature of the virus. Shown here are doctors Anthony Fauci and Rochelle Walensky, the top official scientists in the US. As Omicron is spreading uncontrolled throughout the country, they have done everything possible to disarm the population and prematurely declare the Omicron variant milder than previous variants of the virus. They haven't gone as far as officials in other countries to declare that it would be beneficial for Omicron to spread through society, but their policies will have the same result. The precise virulence and lethality of Omicron will be determined in time, but the rapid surge of hospitalizations and warnings from scientists on the ground in South Africa indicate that it will likely be similarly severe as previous variants, if not more so due to its higher transmissibility. The data released in multiple studies this week indicates that Omicron will cause a dramatic reduction in the ability of the Pfizer mRNA and other vaccines uh, to prevent infection with Omicron. In the UK, there are estimates that Omicron could cause up to 1 million cases per day by Christmas. This is a staggering figure. In the United States, the Delta surge is becoming increasingly dire before Omicron has even taken hold. New cases and hospitalizations are rising across the country as the Delta variant continues to wreak havoc. The seven-day moving average of new cases is now just under 120,000, while over 60,000 people are now hospitalized, including over 15,000 in intensive care units. An average of just over 1,200 people are now dying every day in the US, which is expected to rise dramatically in the coming weeks. It's clear that Omicron will vastly intensify an already catastrophic situation. So with that introduction, I'd ask Dr. Leonardi to begin his report, which provides more information on Omicron. Okay, so this is a brief overview of the immunology surrounding Omicron. Next slide. Okay, so uh, there's a significant conformational change to the spike protein. And the spike protein is quite important because this is how it binds to ACE2 and, and gets inside of the cell. So um, on the far right, we can see, and this is from Alexis Berger uh, on Twitter, we can see all the changes in spike that have occurred in Omicron and uh, starting from uh, the very beginning, and then we have beta, gamma, and delta. And uh, we can just see there's a massive amount of changes, changes in these residues, and residues are um, the single amino acids on a protein. When that happens, when you have so many changes, uh, it changes the shape of the protein. And so uh, there's a general rule, um, when you see a different shape of the protein, you know, the, the, the antibody epitopes should see it differently as well. And antibody, um, antibodies are 
uh, what, what will bind to the protein to kind of knock it down or neutralize it. Next slide. So again, uh, this is a difference between Delta and Omicron. Uh, as you can see in this modeling, there's a significant shape change to Omicron. There's a high amount of mutated residues. Uh, now, now, what this implies is there will be uh, a drastic change in the antibodies that would bind Omicron from something like Delta or uh, the uh, Wuhan 1.0, uh, the wild type virus. Um, next slide. Yeah, so, so also uh, Omicron had about 50 changes in spike. Um, and so it was just a massive leap in, in changes in evolution. And when, when there's such a, a leap in the change of confirmation and in the change of these uh, areas where antibodies would bind, it means that there's a significant amount of escape. Um, so there's one refinement that I want to talk about on uh, Omicron's spike protein, and that is its ability to bind ACE2. So it's gotten better. It is more uh, energi uh, energ energetically favorable now with its binding to ACE2. So uh, one group claimed that it will have increased binding affinity to ACE2. And what this could mean is that it could have a higher transmission rate. And now what we're seeing also is the fantastic amount of transmission that it's been doing. So if, you, if you've looked at these uh, waves and the increase in testing positivity, it's gone right up and quickly. Next slide. So of course, ACE2 binding is important because uh, our antibodies work to, to knock down spike and kind of what they call sterically inhibit, which means to impede you know, the physical binding of spike protein to ACE2. So usually, so our antibodies are very, very fast to knock down spike um, once we have the antibodies from vaccination or from prior infection, um, and they'll prevent a subsequent reinfection or subsequent infection after you've been vaccinated. Uh, and this is just an illustration from an MDPI article um, of, see the antibodies in yellow, sterically inhibiting the binding of spike to ACE2. So here's the thing though, Th this is a type of um, competitive inhibition. So the antibodies are competing for that site on spike, what they call the, re the receptor binding domain, RBD. Um, and ACE2 is also, it's also competing uh, for that spot on the receptor binding domain. So they both have different affinities, basically how, how, how well they'll bind. Um, there's something called the dissociation constant as well. And that's the concentration in molarity uh, where 50% of the receptor is occupied. So um, the problem, the thing about uh, Omicron is likely that dissociation constant uh, for the ACE2 binding of spike is lower meaning you have, if you have lower concentrations of that spike protein, um, half of the ACE2 receptors present uh, would, be, uh, would be bound, something like that. Um, so as, as the RBD of uh, Omicron spike and you know, spike becomes better at binding, it will be thermodynamically more favorable and likely that spike engages an ACE2 receptor before an antibody is able to engage it and block it, knock it down. So that is a, a, a big challenge, I think, and will pose a big challenge in the future if spike continues to evolve um, because it will have better binding to ACE2 than kind of what our antibodies can kick out. Next slide, please. So I, I have mentioned the dissociation constant limitation. So here's, um, there was a theoretical uh, experiment. It was done in vitro and it was uh, meant to mimic the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So basically as you continually passage it in vitro, um, it will, uh, you, you can select for more favorable, um, well, it will actually select itself by virtue of competition of more favorable changes to spike. So what they found, what one group found was that if you keep allowing spike to evolve on the virus, it eventually gets down to picomolar level 
of uh, binding of a dissociation constant. Um, now here's the problem with that. And I think it was around six picomolar or 12 picomolar. Our antibodies that are usually elicited from infection or vaccination around um, or in the nanomolar range, maybe around 50 nanomolar. Um, now that is, that is orders of magnitude uh, different uh, uh, than, than what, what spike can theoretically evolve to. Now the problem is as spike gets better and evolves as Omicron is a stepwise iteration in this evolution uh, and in this pattern, and we can see that it's fantastically transmitting. It has a huge growth advantage and people are claiming that it's gonna end the pandemic. Well, when this thing further refines um, and it gets better uh, ACE2 binding, that can go down to the picomolar level, it's also gonna create um, another wave. And that evolution is almost assured in the immune-free in vitro experiments that were shown, that, that showed the spikes evolution. So, um, so when that happens, our, we can't necessarily evolve or you know, adapt to just generate and throw out these picomolar level uh, antibody binders of, um, of, of spike with that great uh, affinity. We can't necessarily do that. However, we do have some um, monoclonals that are at that level, but uh, it will be a challenge for vaccine immunity and for um, and for uh, uh, infection-based immunity. Next slide. Uh, well, just if I could pause you, just if you could clarify that a bit, uh, but just maybe explain a bit what you mean by the difference between mo the monoclonals and the vaccines. The monoclonals are essentially treatments yeah. once you're infected. Yeah, well, the monoclonals can also be prophylactically used as well, but the thing about the monoclonals is what they represent are the best antibodies that we have against SARS-CoV-2 and against the spike. Um, so what, what the monoclonals are, are it's those antibodies that are super, super good. Basically they are down to the picomolar level and you can be given them um, either prophylactically before you've been infected uh, or after you've been infected as a treatment. And I know President Trump got the Regeneron and these are, uh, you know, these are very good monoclonals. Um, and the, the, the thing is the spike protein can refine down to that level. And I think below, below the level, which is better than the monoclonals eventually. Um, now there's, there's something else to that. So the group, uh, the group wanted to, to test um, whether antibodies could still inhibit um, the, the, the spike that has the super high, uh, super great affinity. They can, but when they did the test, they let the antibodies coat spike for an hour before introducing the ACE2. Now that gives the antibodies a, a great time advantage um, and it was still able to prevent infection, but that might not recapitulate what happens in, uh, in normal life, you know, when somebody's exposed to, to the virus. Uh, it, it might not be that you have any antibodies coating your mucosal surfaces that are able to knock down, you know, that can incubate with the, with the virus for an hour that are able to knock down the spike protein. So it's a concerning kinetic that we have to watch out for. And it, it, makes, me, it makes me concerned about the future of the evolution of the spike protein, as I'm sure uh, many others are. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Leonardi, just to follow up to um, Evan's question. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I just wanted to clarify maybe for the viewers, what it sounds like you're saying is the dynamic affinity of Omicron and future uh, development of the virus, its evolution, it's able to bind ACE2 receptors faster at orders of magnitude, potentially even faster than antibodies can not bind yet. it. So, so that's not a facet of uh, Omicron yet, but Omicron represents um, a stepwise iteration to the extreme uh, receptor binding. Okay, so Omicron is not beating antibodies at all yet, as far as this goes, as far as its affinity. Um, but uh, it, it portends a, a change for the future, a word, you know, something that may come true, may not, um, but it is concerning. The, the competitive advantage that Omicron is exhibiting 
uh, may be in part because of this ability to bind ACE2, and it is not at the full potential of what the spike protein can be. Uh, uh, that's what I'm saying. So it does not yet beat an antibodies as far as the dissociation constant goes. Sure. The, the follow-up question is, is there an amount of antibodies that need to bind a virus particle before it makes it ineffective? And the second question is, do antibodies, once they are bound to the spike, permanently bound, or can they come off as well? Um, the, the recent paper that I read on this specific issue about the, the permanence of binding, it was somewhat, um, I can't say that it's a permanent uh, change, uh, but it was, it was durable. It was effective and it prevented infection for a long time. I mean, it was, it was quite durable. So that was a very good sign and the paper reiterated that. Uh, your earlier question was, um, I, what, can you repeat it? Right, How, so I'm assuming that the, the Viron has many spikes on it. And so you need, yeah. how, what percentage of the spikes need to be bound by antibodies before it makes it uh, lacks the ability to bind to the ACE receptor? Mm, I don't know the percentage, but I, I do know that uh, we have crude levels of measuring this. And basically they are the titers that we use. Like, They'll, they'll say, what are your antibody titers? And then they'll normalize that to what is kind of effective at knocking down the virus. Um, I don't know the exact uh, biophysical quantity or percentage uh, of spike that needs to be occupied or covered by, a, by an antibody, but um, I know that it's normalized. I'm not sure about that. That's more of a structural uh, and biochemical question. Thank you. Yeah, so um, there, see, there is residual binding as the paper um, showed, but again, it was uh, in the test, they gave, um, they gave the antibodies an hour lead time to cover up uh, the virus, which, which may not be the case if our vaccines are inducing uh, what is IgG instead of IgA, which is what is this, this, IgG is more like the systemic antibody, systemic immunity rather than um, the IgA, which is the mucosal. So um, I, I, can, I can imagine where uh, if, if the virus contacts a mucosal surface, it may you know, sit in that mucosa for, for an hour and then be neutralized by the IgA. But it, it, there is some concern there that um, if with a very high uh, affinity of the RBD that we might not be able to have that advantage of an hour long pre-neutralization. Uh, so, so it, it's a toss up. We'll see what happens. And I would like for them to repeat this experiment, maybe without the hour long incubation, maybe something uh, times zero times five minute time 10 minute, uh, so that we can kind of have a kinetic of this of this uh, competition. Next slide. Okay, so uh, going back to T cells, there's a lot of good news about the conserved T cell epitopes. The issue is that I see and some others may bring it up, that when these cytotoxic virus specific T cells act, they do so by killing cells, uh, by killing cells that present peptides of, of the virus. Um, so there are many of these, uh, of these um, T cell epitopes that are conserved. Um, I know that uh, the SET lab, SET A lab over at UCSD uh, was showing there was a high amount of uh, very, very high amount of conserved uh, T cell epitopes. Um, and, and there was a high amount of T cell conserved epitopes on the spike protein as well. But the issue is that the T cells take a while to reach that uh, effector stage. They have to do something called differentiate. So they, they see their specific um, epitope. They see the, the, the short sequence of virus that they're presented from the infected cell. And then uh, they'll, they'll take some time to be stimulated. So the thing is, uh, when you have mild and moderate illness, the T cells may not be able to act quick enough to quell that, to, to kind of cut mild and moderate illness. Um, and we see that because um, the AstraZeneca vaccine is very good at priming these T cells. And unfortunately, um, for, for immune escape or for antibody, I shouldn't say immune escape, I should say antibody escape variants, such as uh, B1351 uh, beta. So 
uh, when they did a clinical trial of AstraZeneca versus beta, uh, it didn't show efficacy versus mild and moderate uh, COVID-19 for beta, even though it has a high amount of conserved T cell epitopes. Well, the T cell response lags. Um, and not only that, T cells, they kill infected cells. Um, and, and there are a few papers now that show that there's a high, uh, you know, that there's a residual CD8 response that's contributing to some of the features of, um, of long COVID or PASC, uh, uh, post-acute sequelae of COVID-19, I think it's called. Um, so, so the T cell, it's, it's somewhat good news, um, somewhat reassuring. Maybe it pre prevents uh, progression of severe disease. Um, it could. The problem is it hasn't been proven yet, but, um, but that's usually how the T cells work and they are kind of a last defense. And this is a, um, this is a wonderful figure uh, that we've taken from uh, uh, this, this doctor, this frontline medic that he's made that show kind of T cells as the third defense. Okay, next slide. Dr. Leonardi, just briefly, you mentioned that AstraZeneca primes T cells. Um, what, what about the mRNA vaccines? They also prime the T cells. There's, there's uh, data, a bit conflicting data saying, oh, it's, it's, you know, when they tried, to, when they looked at the blood and said, oh, whether or not it's priming the T cells as much, but it absolutely primes the T cells well. Um, that all these, all these vaccines are priming the T cells. But uh, the AstraZeneca in one publication, I can't remember which one it was, was showing that the T cells were primed at a higher level. So they all do. Okay, so um, altogether, the immune implications of Omicron. So there's significant serious escape, which is the antibody binding. So this will permit kind of allow reinfections to occur. Um, there was, uh, I guess the bad news was that two um, mRNA shots or jabs uh, don't confer a lot of protection. So there is some vaccine-based immunity escape, but with a third dose of mRNA, I think you boost those, um, those lonely antibodies that still recognize Omicron to a level that is able to opsonize Omicron to prevent um, you know, symptomatic infection. So when you're preventing symptomatic infection, you're, you're cutting down the virus to a level in early stages and that is done best by antibodies, not necessarily T cells. Um, so I really advise everyone to follow the advice that has currently been let out, given out, and go and get a, uh, a third dose, a booster, um, if you can. Next slide. Dr. Leonardi, I, I apologize for yeah. um, asking no questions, problem. but I wanted to uh, touch on another issue. Um, you had raised that um, about the um, the, the vaccines um, and, and the drop in titers. Now, the Pfizer statement that was released this previous week had noted a 25-fold decrease between the original uh, uh, ancestral strain, if I'm correct. Yeah. Um, but, and, and then uh, with people who had a booster, it went back up 25-fold. Um, Great. But those, the Sarah of the people they used had just been fully vaccinated and had just been given a booster. Uh, yeah. a, term, a German scientist looked actually at uh, Sarah of people who had been vaccinated six months prior. Um, and when they checked the uh, uh, neutralizing antibodies for AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J, &J, they said essentially there was uh, no neutralization titer. Yeah, and those were with two vaccines and it was six months ago, correct? Correct. Can you speak to that? Yeah. What does that imply? Well, be, uh, okay. So um, specifically what it implies are two things. One, we will need, we may need Omicron specific uh, boosters and boosters for the next variants that come out as well. We may, um, it implies that. And two, it implies there is a waning uh, of immunity so I, I'd be also very interested in uh, the level of neutralization, um, and it may have been released, I'm not sure, of uh, people just given two doses uh, and then fresh, you know, check their sera fresh. Um, but what it, what it ultimately boils down to, and I could, I could look at all the granularity of this, um, 
but what it ultimately boils down to is that we need, you know, everybody's going to need a third dose and um, adjustments along the path of evolution, along the path of SARS-CoV-2's evolution uh, are, are going to be necessary, especially, especially if we find out if each, um, if each iteration of, uh, of the spike protein, which confers better ACE2 binding, is going to have such rapid transmission as we're seeing now. So Omicron is, is very, very rapid in its transmission. We can see uh, the great speed in, in inducing positivity in populations. So um, we're going to need updated vaccines. And I think that the CEO of BioNTech has also, um, has also said this. So yeah, it implies two things. We're, go we're going to need uh, maybe variant specific vaccines and the second thing is that there's going to be waning. And if you also, there's a situation where Delta and Omicron can circulate uh, together um, and, and we kind of have two dominant variants of SARS-CoV-2 that, that may need uh, kind of separate vaccine strategies. I'm not saying that will be the case, but it's a possibility. But I do know that, um, that Pfizer was working on uh, variant specific vaccines and they were able to show good amounts of neutralization uh, to other variants. So I'm not sure which, which way they'll go with this, but, um, it, but it's certainly, it, you know, there, there's certainly such rapid evolution in this virus and in the spike protein and uh, our therapeutics and our vaccines are gonna have to kind of catch up with it. Hopefully maybe even lead it off if we get smart enough, we'll see. I, I was wondering also just uh, sort of a follow up on that. There was a paper published yesterday in uh, SSRN. Uh, it was sort of a, a case study with only uh, seven people, but they were all young people. I think the average age was uh, 27 uh, and they'd all recently had their, their booster shot uh, and all seven showed mild to moderate uh, symptoms you know, from breakthrough infections. Uh, I believe four yeah. out of five you know, reported headaches uh, and one uh, lost their uh, sense of taste and smell uh, for one day. Um, and so I guess I was wondering if you, if you, you mentioned that the, uh, it's likely that there will be um, you know, less uh, sort of symptomatic uh, breakthrough cases with once you have your booster with Omicron, but um, this sort of initial study indicates that that might not be the case. There's also been reports um, in the US of other, other people that have had symptomatic breakthrough cases uh, despite having the yeah. booster. And also, um, yeah, I've seen that. I saw that one. And also the UK released um, some information that they expected 80% protection from symptomatic um, infection with the third uh, Pfizer dose from one, two, three Pfizer, or, or even uh, two AstraZeneca and then one Pfizer. Um, it's it's so varied. I, I, I the the amount of information out there, you know, really varies. But personally, from what I understand. Um, I think, you know, if you have, at this point, if you've had your third dose, you're still going to need um, a good mask like an N95 or something, uh, because it's not going to, it's, it's not going to completely stop infection and onward transmission, which are, which is also an issue if, you know, because here's the thing, like we live, you know, we, we live with other people that can eventually get sick if you decide to, you know, just onward transmit. Um, not that one makes a decision, but if you're going to just not wear a mask or something, um, you're going to potentially carry the virus, whether it be asymptomatic or symptomatic, and then you can pass it forward to someone who may be, uh, who may end up in the hospital. So um, the information, there's such a gamut of information out there and it, it, it all is very cacophonous, you know, and I, I, I think the best thing to urge right now would be for the airborne mitigations, like to pretend as if, you know, uh, you know, you're not vaccinated and maybe you can catch it and pass it on. So wear a good mask, you know, N95, et cetera, be a, you know, be a social, a pro-social person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Which isn't, you know, it's not really, um, you know, they say it sort of in that, um, so they, they um, tag that on to what they you know get your booster wear a mask but they don't specify you know n95s are better uh, they don't really they've never really explained airborne yeah. yeah that's a that's a huge disappointment because um i think i think they're reluctant to say oh definitely use n95s because they they anticipate supply problems but i think that the supply issue could be uh you know could rise to the occasion 
So if there if there well, was it, it more actually, than yeah. Oh, sorry. Go it ahead. actually already already has. We did an interview with uh, Nicholas Smith uh, a couple of weeks yeah. ago, and you know, for months now they've had, uh, you know, they've they've had adequate supply of uh, N95s, um, and that you know, there's also elastomeric respirators. There's mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of options that are available, but you know, that's not the best. At least here in the U.S., the vast majority of people are wearing surgical masks or cloth masks, which don't provide protection, mm -hmm. ad adequate protection. And and I think there's another issue here too. Um, I think it could be possible that Omicron is more severe, especially if it's putting a lot of kids in the hospital. And the way that can be, uh, can be confounded, um, you know, they're saying that, oh, all these cases are mild so far. And then when you look at the skewing of the cases between the first, second, third, and, and Omicron wave in South Africa, you see that there's a younger skewing right now for these Omicron cases. Well, that could be because uh, the youth, the younger people have a tendency to not zero convert um, and, and to not have very large memory formation. Um, and usually zero, uh, strong zero conversion is correlated with more symptomatic and more severe cases. So the youth, um, so it could appear that there's like a predominance of more mild, um, mild infections because one, the population is younger and two, there's a level of immunity already in the population. Now, here's the thing though, when you wanna look at uh, a population that's not going to have so much seroconversion, um, you look at the youth, uh, the age zero to five, they, they seroconvert less from SARS-CoV-2 infection. So those, those, uh, that demographic right now is being hard hit. And so I think what may happen is that when this uh, spreads within maybe the UK or the United States or somewhere else, um, it might it might hit uh, the youth a bit harder, and it might actually be it might actually be more severe of an infection, not necessarily uh, a lighter, more mild infection. Everybody's saying it's mild because uh, we've been all swimming in SARS-CoV-2 for for the last two years and wearing cloth masks. So um, so I'm interested in seeing some type of um, you know what it truly is, and maybe some type of epidemiological normalization or even normalization in the lab so you, we'll see about that could you just explain you um could you just explain uh, a bit more sort of what you mean by uh zero conversion just for our uh audience yeah um, so yeah, that's, yeah. that's that's the development of antibodies that neutralize and recognize the virus um sometimes i mean the quality of antibodies too uh, that comes out it, it's much better from vaccination from an mrna vaccination uh, the zero conversion, and that's again. So sera is, uh, you know, the is is kind of what they call the the blood, uh, the the uh, liquid in the blood that carries the antibodies. Um, and conversion means you've you've uh, had a change. Your your blood can now uh, knock down the virus, and that's conferred by the antibodies that you get from infection or vaccination. Um, and you were, so, saying that, you were saying that that uh, tends to be worse in children, that the ability to seroconvert? For, yeah, for some reason, children um, do not seroconvert, which is means gain antibodies in their blood as readily as adults do once they have the infection. Um, so also, so when you do a study on infection in the youth and you use seroconversion as your positive marker, you're skewing to avoid, you're, you're avoiding the cases in the youth that do not zero convert, uh, which is, um, which happens more often in the youth than with adults. Adults are more likely to zero convert. So if you, if you, if you go and do a study uh, in a school system and say, we're gonna see how many infections there were in the school system and in schools, and we're only gonna look at the blood for antibodies in these kids, then uh, you're going to miss out on all those infections that happened where they didn't seroconvert. So, um, so yeah, seroconversion is um, is something that can kind of confer some future uh, protection. Now, here's the thing, though. I, I find it uh, inherently unethical to ask po a population to seroconvert by virtue of the infection. Uh, and, and a lot of people right. don't find that unethical, and that's very disappointing. Yeah, no, it's it's very very been very disturbing. I actually write a lot on uh, the situation with uh, school reopenings and uh, you know during the pandemic, and it's just it's been horrific. Um, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics estimates that uh, over six million children have 
or they, they've logged uh, over 6 million official cases, uh, but then the CDC has done uh, seroprevalence studies, which indicate that over 26 million children uh, under 18, roughly a third of, of that population has, uh, has you know, already been infected with, with COVID-19. Wow. And, and that's no, from seroprevalence. Exactly, right? exactly. <laughs> right. So they're underestimating. So what probably happened, many of those kids got reinfected until they finally seroconverted. Right. No, it's, it's just, it's, uh, it's absolutely, uh, hor it's, it's horrible and it's really just, it's horrendous. And, uh, you know, it's been, um, you know, it's been the, the, uh, the powers that be have implemented these, these policies really continuously throughout the, throughout the pandemic, uh, not just well, in the U S but globally. What also worries me is that, um, the kids, uh, even though they're asymptomatic, they'll still have x-ray changes in their lungs, uh, that are visible, like what they call ground glass opacities. Um, so even though they're walking around, you know, they're not necessarily like, you know, keeled over like somebody in their 50s would be, uh, they're still having significant changes on radiographs and things. So their, right. their physiology is still taking a hit. And I was particularly disturbed uh, by, by one study that showed 25% of mild cases in yeah. adults. One year later, when they followed up, they had lung diffusion issues. Now, lung diffusion is when oxygen goes, you know, oxygen and carbon dioxide, they go through your lungs. You know, you need, you need, you need uh, this gas of oxygen and carbon dioxide to go through. What they, do, what they do is they use carbon monoxide as a measurement of how well your, uh, well, usually I think it's carbon monoxide. I'm not sure, but um, I might be wrong on that because uh, it's been a while. But so they measure the diffusion. And so uh, a, a deficit in diffusion implies, it, it really implies damage. There's something wrong in that kind of, um, there was a pulmonologist that commented, uh, usually those changes, you know, they can be, they can be permanent and they can signify uh, a level of fibrosis. So um, it particularly worries me that one mild infection can do that to adults. What about two or three mild infections in a, in a child, you know, that still is having those x-ray uh, changes in their lungs, and then they're finally, you know, infected to they seroconvert. Um, I, I anticipate some degree of disability down the line. And, and, and it's kind of upsetting to see um, some people um, kind of say, oh, I don't expect, you know, I don't expect the virus to to incapacitate the youth that much to, to kind of shape uh, our future um, genetics. Well, yeah. I think there's going to be significant disability. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of worried about, um, I'm worried about our future labors, our labor force and everything. If they're asked to constantly get infected, you know, especially the kids without vaccines, if they're going to be healthy, you know, and have, you know, happy, productive lives. Uh, I particularly enjoy sport, you know, and, um, you know, in water polo, you have to hold your breath a lot. Same with diving. And uh, there was one, there was one piece of news that came out that divers are having a lot of trouble diving. You know, after getting SARS-CoV-2. So it, it's it's really disappointing to see what's going on. Yeah, and that's also you know been sort of the the central um, the main the main policy that's uh, been implemented. Inside aside from promoting boosters in uh, in his speech one week after uh, Omicron was. De declared a variant of concern, Biden announced that uh, they would begin implementing a, uh, what they call a test to stay program uh, in schools across the country. So basically if a kid uh, tests positive in your classroom, uh, the, the entire class no longer goes into quarantine, but if they then test negative, they can stay learning, learning in person. Uh, so it's, you know, it's basically escalating or, you know, continuing this, this policy of really uh, keeping the schools open uh, and, and really, you know, putting, um, you know, millions of children at danger of potential, you know, long-term illness. Um, so why don't, yeah, yeah. Why don't we, we'll come back to some of these issues a bit later, I think, but maybe do you want to conclude your, your report? We've kind of digressed a little bit. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, uh, the third mRNA boost is uh, very essential. Uh, I think everybody needs to go and get their third dose. Absolutely. Next slide. And the broader implications are that evolution of Omicron. Somebody else had mentioned um, that uh, William Hazeltine, who is a public health um, scientist, very good. He mentioned that he's seeing rapid evolution of Omicron. 
And uh, I also I also took a look, and it, it does appear that Omicron is rapidly evolving and is very is gaining a lot of diversity. So with that rapid evolution can come that better ACE2 binding that uh, we were talking about. So um, I, I do not think that this will be the last wave of a variant of concern. And I am concerned about the future evolution of SARS-CoV-2. And we will need vaccine updates, likely um, indefinitely the booster. So thank you. I think that concludes my presentation. Excellent. Thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Leonardi. Um, so I think the, the plan now is to uh, continue the discussion. And uh, I believe Benjamin has uh, some additional points. Uh, he's been following the uh, uh, developments with Omicron uh, very, very closely uh, and writing on them uh, on the WSWS. Uh, so Benjamin, did you want to speak a bit and then ask a, a question of Dr. Leonardi? Sure. Um, I think many of the World Socialist website readers and in general, the population has been following closely uh, the reports of Omicron spreading to various countries. Uh, as you had mentioned, Evan, um, 63, I think now 66 or 67 countries have detected it. Uh, so just to you know, put this into contact, I think it took Delta uh, three months to you know, six months to um, dominate. We're, we're seeing um, Omicron it, it, detected on you know, November 9th, you know, made a variant of concern on November 24th by the World Health Organization. And now we're on December 11th and we're seeing 66 countries across the globe you know, report it. Now, obviously the conditions for Omicron are right in that uh, the policies that are in place uh, are, you know, schools are open, you know, return back to work, um, uh, no infringement on profit motives and profit accumulation. Um, vaccines are, are the only way out. So uh, that's why we're seeing surges of Delta in Europe. That's why we're seeing surges of Delta in the United States, uh, death rates are continuing to uh, be at an alarmingly high rate. And now Omicron is uh, spreading uh, and spreading very quickly because of the conditions that we have allowed Delta to spread makes Omicron also equally um, transmissible uh, along broad geographical you know, uh, areas. Um, this, this leads me to the question based on the science of, of these uh, neutralizing titers is, I guess, to, when we say people are fully vaccinated, that's no longer true with two doses. Fully vaccinated means three doses. Uh, I, I would ask Dr. Leonardi if he would agree with that. In an Omicron, you know, uh, hypothetical Omicron dominant world, three doses of an mRNA vaccine would be considered fully vaccinated. Um, and in that sense, if only three to 4% of the population of the planet has received their booster shots, everybody is partially vaccinated. And if we're partially vaccinated, what does that imply? What does that mean towards all the um, measures that have been put in place, basically saying you have to be fully vaccinated to attend work. You have to be fully vaccinated to uh, go to school. You have to be fully vaccinated to be able to participate. I don't hear anything being said about these requirements changing. I don't see any policy shifts uh, if we acknowledge that uh, the majority of the world is partially vaccinated and not fully vaccinated. Dr. Leonardi, maybe you want to add something to this. Yeah, I'm not sure of any um, mandates and policy, but um, I do know that um, in, in the U.S. there's a relative glut of vaccines. And uh, I, I do know some people, though, who have, tr who have gone as recently as like maybe a couple of weeks ago, and tried to get a third mRNA dose and were told that they were not eligible yet because they were not six months out, they were still only five months out. So, um, so I'm, I'm not sure of all the policy um, and they're definitely going to have to work out some kinks, you know, given that uh, three doses is now fully vaccinated. Um, so I can't, I can't really comment beyond that. I, I just, uh, yeah, I, I, I view the world as, uh, mostly susceptible to Omicron. So 
uh, and you're saying it's only 3% that have gotten three doses. Well, that's, yeah, that's uh, substantial, so. Yeah, the other issue too is some people have asked this question, when do I get my fourth shot? I mean, the, so the CEO of uh, Pfizer said he was expecting um, to give the fourth shot a year after, but on CNBC, he said, that may have to be sooner. In his own sort of, you know, I don't want to be very accurate, but I don't want to say anything wrong. Um, uh, do you foresee that we need to ask for the fourth shot at six months? And if that's the case, there are very many people who are getting their boosters who are reaching that six month mark. So, so Omicron has spread faster then we are able to work out all the science around it uh, as people, you know? Um, so that's the problem, I think. Uh, it, it emerged so rapidly. It was, you know, announced a variant of concern uh, in, in the end of November. It's still early December, almost mid-December. Um, nobody really knows yet. And, and I think the next, uh, the next variant that comes out that has better ACE2 binding is going to be just as rapid, especially if we're all working to open everything up and open up you know, travel and uh, airline flights and everything. It's going to just be rapid. I think I mentioned this. Um, I wrote a bit about it, that because of um, the mechanisms of positive feedback on evolution. So basically, Omicron is evolving very rapidly. Um, it has a huge transmission um, advantage. So that, so the next, so the next step of evolution from Omicron and with Omicron is going to come more rapidly. And also, we're changing our behavior as people. We're we're traveling more. We're uh, unmasking and everything, and we're giving each other um, enough SARS-CoV-2 to to maintain high titers. It appears, but the youth are getting hit harder. Um, it's going to more rapidly spread through populations. So. If the next variant that arises with a better binding to ACE2 comes out and it's more transmissible by that feature, it's going to even more rapidly permeate. And it's going to be uh, a big challenge for us to understand, well, what's the confirmation now? What are the antibodies that bind it? What level of vaccination do we even need? Um, do we need to make new vaccines? It's all going to be a very, very great challenge. And, and this thing can evolve faster and spread faster then we can address it, uh, you know, without, without, uh, I don't know if we could have even, you know, locked down quick enough to stop Omicron. I think by the time many countries imposed, um, imposed flight restrictions, now they may help, they may, they may stop the flow of the virus in, but by the time many uh, places tried to lock down, it was already, it was already all throughout. So that's, it's only going to get worse. And I think what we need to do about that is make it safer for public spaces with um, ventilation and uh, filtration and masking because it's only going to get worse and quicker. The next one, if it if it has to displace Omicron, it's either going to be have to be uh, hugely immune evasive, not immune evasive, but um, antibody evasive, sera evasive, or have a huge gain in uh, the ability to transmit uh, by virtue of the binding. So, yeah, it's going to be nobody knows. Like I said. Like the UK data that came out, okay, three vaccines confer about 80% protection. And then the, the case studies that came out of Germany showing that um, a high amount of, uh, of youthful people, like in their 20s, you know, seven of them were infected, all symptomatic. It's going to be, there's going to be stochastic differences in information. And um, all the companies are going to work, you know, separately and same with academic institutions. And there's going to be a lot of discord. Um, unfortunately, and that's just unfortunately how how slow our, our knowledge uh, accumulation is going to be in the dynamics of it. Um, Dr. Leonardi, uh, just maybe changing it uh, briefly to, uh, you had tweeted repeatedly that um, Omicron variant was being described as mild, almost, you know, uh, it's mild, it's, you know, it's going to be mildly killing people, it's going to be mildly you know, affecting people's, you know, cognition. Um, and it's the, the term mild has been so pervasive in print and broadcast media. Um, uh, can you can you speak to it? Because I could tell that you were very frustrated by this description. So maybe you, this is a moment for you to maybe speak about um, why this, why is the media, why are government leaders calling it mild when they should be calling it, this is a public health emergency. 
So the initial cases, especially if they're in the youth, um, they're going to appear mild by nature. I think even the even the um, even very very bad viruses, you know, in youth and um, in the majority of cases, appear mild. It was sort of it was sort of almost like a palliation, like um, like a palliative message, and um, it, it was meant to it was meant to kind of pacify, you know, because there was a big there was there was a large reaction everywhere. I think even in the stock markets, there was a very large reaction. And um, everybody was like, oh my gosh, you know, a new variant has emerged, it's spreading rapidly. Oh, so far all cases are mild. Well, of course, if the majority of cases of SARS-CoV-2 um, are in fact mild and asymptomatic, um, then, then that's, not, that's not necessarily a lie. But um, what, what was implied was that it was milder than all the other variants of concern not that it was, or that it was mild by nature. So already it, it's at a level of severity, you know, uh, beta and gamma and delta, they're all at a level of severity already. But to imply that this is, oh, it's definitely mild. It's more, it's a step on, you know, people are also conflating it with a step to endemicity that it will be a mild infection like a cold. Um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a conflation. Someone did clear that up. But it, um, it, it was kind of like the implication that it, that it was milder. And that's not necessarily the case. We don't have a good baseline of, um, of data to look and see if the, the virus itself is, more, is in fact more mild than the other variants of concern. And um, it, it appears, you know, because of that skewing in demographic of uh, the youth going to the hospital much more this way than the prior ones, that it may in fact be more severe, and it does carry a number of mutations that are uh, that do correlate with more severe disease. So um, they, it was kind of like a palliative message um, that it was more mild, and in doing that, um, I think people may have let their guard down, and we will continue to leave our guard down. Right now, you can see the discourse on the internet is, oh, it's more mild. It's, it's a step to, you know, being a common cold. And that may very not be, you know, what, what it actually is. Um, it may be that it's, it's, uh, it could be appearing milder because of a, a level of prior immunity. And also it could be appearing mild because uh, we're actually, you know, intensely looking at the cases of Omicron um, because of its you know, because of how it stands out so much that we're over over sampling, not over sampling, but we're sampling more of of all the uh, asymptomatic and mild cases um, than before, you know, because uh, testing used to be very poor um, before, but we've we've kind of upped the up the game of tracking Omicron. So it was very disappointing to see, yes, that um, a lot of people you know, spread the message through the public that it's definitely more mild. It may be more mild. It's unlikely though. I think that there's a level of immunity in the population and I think that level does not exist in the youth. And so it may be more severe as well. Um, but it was, uh, it, it was such a, it was kind of a ridiculous message uh, early on when, when the first cases were out that they were just, oh, that it's definitely mild. It got conflated with milder, which we, we aren't sure with. Dr. Um, Gasparovich, she's a biologist at, um, in Calgary, and she also does a lot of modeling, uh, Malagorzada Gasparovich. Uh, she had done some work where she had shown that uh, original strain, uh, yeah, I think alpha, delta, because of the increased transmissibility, that the combination of vaccine, or vaccine alone, public health alone, and combination of the two, that the increased transmissibility of delta would barely contain it if we used meager public health measures and vaccines. And this is a population of vaccination that is even above where we are now. And she said, if a more transmissible virus were to evolve, that neither vaccines and meager public health measures would really contain the, the virus. More recently, she actually has started to work. Uh, we spoke and, um, she said that um, she was looking at data where looking at transmissibility and virulence. So if the virus is slow and it's very deadly, 
the death rates aren't going to climb very quickly. But if it's very transmissible, and if it's even 10 times less deadly, uh, let's say instead of 0.06 percent, it's 0 0.06, the number of people that are going to die over a certain period of time is astronomical in comparison. Um, yeah. Thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And it makes perfect sense. And kind of the social psychology aspect around it is um, if you're working in a hospital, um, the, the more transmissible variant that may be uh, half as deadly is going to be much more substantial. You're going to have much more patients that come in, uh, many more patients that come in, and it's going to be a, a huge tax and burden on the health system. Um, but, you know, as from an individual standpoint out in the community, they may think, um, wait, it's half as deadly. You know, I might, you know, I might uh, not restrict myself as much or wear a mask, you know, because it's more like a common cold. Maybe I'll gain immunity. So they're more likely to catch it. So it it kind of widens the gap uh, between between these two systems, uh, the the person out in the community and then the healthcare system. So. Um, absolutely like a, uh, a less lethal and more transmissible variant will be a huge problem, especially for health systems. And in fact, when Ebola, um, when Ebola becomes less uh, lethal and more transmissible, that, and that's usually the one that escapes and, and enters the human population then causes uh, uh, you know, a, minor, a minor spike or, or, or jump in cases uh, when it's less, less lethal. So, um, so yeah, there's a huge disconnect there. And um, it could be, I mean, it might not even be less lethal. It might be that there's a level of immunity in the population, but Dr. Gispowich, um, if I'm saying her name correctly, she's correct. I, I agree with her and I, and I can understand that. So um, it's kind of up, up to the um, public health system to recognize that sure, um, you know, it may be it may be less deadly, but if it's infecting more people, it might have a significant impact on the health system. And I think that I think that the UK has recently uh, has recently seen that they ran the numbers maybe, and they've they've recognized, oh, you know, we may need to uh, place some restrictions. Um, we'll see what happens with that, uh, but um, but yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I think those are uh, really really critical points, and I think just the um, the whole framing of this as, you know, potentially, uh, or just, just claiming outright that it's, that it's milder, uh, was just completely, um, or ha has been completely premature. Uh, you know, it's it, hospitalizations and deaths are lagging indicators. Uh, and, you know, we won't know, uh, at least for, for deaths, we won't know at least for another uh, few weeks about, um, about that, that aspect of it. Uh, but I think as, as you indicated, um, the, uh, the impact on children is incredibly disturbing. Uh, and a week ago, there were, um, you know, a number of uh, uh, headlines and or articles on uh, the disproportionate impact on children uh, in, in uh, South Africa. And uh, you know, they uh, noted that in the the uh, first week uh, in which the the surge uh, really you know took off um, two two weeks ago. Uh, children under five were experiencing the second highest rate of hospitalization of any age group, uh, and the uh, uh, largest uh, percent uh, within that group were uh, infants under two years old, uh, who accounted for roughly 10% of all hospitalizations uh, during during that week. Um, and then uh, this past Monday, South Africa's health minister stated that there's uh, been a sharp increase in the the number of uh, babies, toddlers, and pregnant women uh, requiring uh, uh, oxygen uh, while hospitalized. Um, so I think, as you as you've indicated, really the uh, the dangers to children are you know really really being downplayed as they as they have been uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, well, it I think sounds like they've gone up, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. Well, the danger the dangers have gone up, but the um, it's been you know downplayed by the media or just ignored outright. Uh, and you know the um, I think you know another uh, phrase or a term that I've seen you and, and many other scientists use on Twitter is uh, hopium. Uh, that you know they uh, sort of uh, you know essentially push this this line. Uh, you know that we have to be be hopeful and just you know look on the bright side. Uh, you know we've got just go get your booster. Everything will be fine. Uh, and it's really um, it's sort of you know it's sort of a, a 
propaganda campaign. And it's just, it has been really unrelenting here in the US, just uh, every day there's some headline, uh, but also internationally throughout Europe, uh, much of the, the world, you know, these headlines uh, prematurely declaring it mild. And then if you actually read the article, it, it usually indicates that it's too early to tell, but the headlines say, you know, that it's mild. And I think it's sort of a concerted effort to, you know, disarm the population. And I think, you know, just the the conditions that already uh, exist uh, before Omicron that have existed with uh, with Delta are just uh, catastrophic. Um, you know, the the uh, average number of uh, daily new cases uh, has, you know, is now uh, above uh, 600,000. Uh, and if you look at the the um, estimates from the IHME at the University of Washington, they estimate that, you know, due to under testing, uh, well over 3 million people are, you know, likely being infected every day. Now Omicron threatens to, you know, massively expand that. Um, so I just, I know I just raised a lot, but maybe if you could speak a bit um, further on on uh, on the dangers posed to children, and maybe also uh, talk about the um, MISC, the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, which uh, I know you, you you referred to earlier. Yeah. So um, yeah, unfortunately, you know, as we all perceive that Omicron may be more mild, uh, given all the messaging. Uh, children are going to bear the brunt of that hubris, uh, and and you know they they've they've had you know the huge skewing of uh, severe disease in South Africa. That's going to occur in other places, I think, uh, quite likely. You know, especially in unvaccinated children. So um, it's very unfortunate that with uh, you you mentioned hopium. So the problem is not necessarily the hope and uh, the expectation that things might be good or better. The problem is the anesthetization of our response, of our, uh, our proper informed response of, of uh, you know, taking safety uh, precautions or many mitigations. The problem is, yeah, saying this is a reason for us to you know, accept the status quo. We're not going to uh, start masking wearing N95s or cleaning the air, we're just going to say, okay, uh, there are conserved T cell epitopes that we're just gonna rely on. Um, we're gonna rely on our last defense, it's great, yeah. Um, I think the problem, yeah, is, is the justification for inertia, especially bureaucratic inertia in addressing these things. Uh, so um, I think it. I think almost, you know, it was a last ditch effort to say Omicron is more mild. Therefore, um, you know, we don't need to adopt all the masking things, and uh, it, you know, we don't need to make changes. Um, I think, especially if we're going to have SARS-CoV-2 is endemic, and we are going to have more variants of concern after Omicron, we're going to have to address this responsibly. Uh, we're going to have to face it, and we can't just, um, you know, say, okay, well, here's here's all the T cell epitopes, everyone. Um, don't worry about, you know, don't worry about that extra HEPA filter, or don't worry about wearing an N95 this winter, um, because uh, it's it's not reasonable to expect um, repeated inf infection with this virus, uh, especially of kids. And um, as far as MISC goes, and uh, the other consequences of infection in the youth. I, I haven't seen or looked for the MISC data in South Africa. So I'm not sure um, if it will emerge, but I do uh, agree with the, the authors of a few papers that the MISC is dependent on the super antigen that's on SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So, um, and I do think that the super antigen uh, still exists on Omicron. Um, I personally have the hypothesis that the super antigen is relevant for not only the MISC, but uh, other cases as well in adults, not MISA, but just generally, I think it's relevant in, um, in causing uh, T cell mediated damage. The hospitalization of the youth and the, the, higher, the higher oxygen usage, I think it will uh, be echoed in other countries and I am very concerned about that. I think we really need to hammer the message that um, we need to start. We need to start filtering the air and make a big public health investment in infrastructure, especially in light of the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 and what it what it may become. Um, if this thing mutates to, to bind ACE2 better, 
we're going to have more transmissible variants. And I, no matter what other people say that the, that the um, super antigen isn't relevant in other cases, that it's only relevant in MISC, I do not think that this infection that cr can create so much autoimmunity, uh, including sending T cells off to peripheral organs uh, or into the periphery, like the brain, uh, will be um, a quote unquote benign or reasonable infection to have in the future. Uh, it won't be like a common cold unless it loses a lot of those pathogenic features. So um, we need to, it's not, it's not reasonable to expect so much infection. We need to start updating infrastructure if we're going to have to live alongside SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, I think those are important points. I was wondering, maybe if you could um, just sort of try to explain in, in layman's terms, or maybe uh, Benjamin, uh, what uh, what you mean by super antigen and also the autoimmune impacts that you referred to. Okay, so the super antigen is a it's a it's a peptide or a short region on SARS-CoV-2 spike protein that is able to stimulate T cells that are not specific to the virus. It's able super antigens can stimulate. Um, well, the CD3, anti-CD3 is kind of super antigen. So let me just work out what, what I should what I should give you as a figure. Super antigens can, can maybe stimulate like 70, 80% of your T cells. So in, your, in someone's blood right now, if you were to take someone's blood, there are a bunch of T cells there. Um, they're gonna recognize different viruses or even cancers, different things, okay? Um, so, so there will also be T cells specific to uh, short parts of SARS-CoV-2, okay? SARS-CoV-2 has, has a little thing on it that's able to stimulate like many, many of your T cells that aren't even specific to um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, now, when it's in the gut, it will, when it's in the gut, that super antigenic biomass, basically those pieces of the virus are able to cause um, a delayed syndrome, MISC, um, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children because it, the, the super antigen will kind of leak out of the gut, okay? It will, it'll make it, the gut will be somewhat permeable um, and the immune system will see the super antigen. Well, what about when you have that super antigen in the lungs, okay? The thing that's stimulating all these T cells broadly. What about in the upper respiratory system? Um, when those T cells are stimulated, they are licensed, they're able, which means they're programmed to kill. They're like 007. They're gonna go places and they're gonna be cytotoxic. They're gonna be cytotoxic right there. Um, and, and so in SARS-CoV-2 infection, what they see is that these T cells will go into places where T cells are usually not. They'll go into the brain even. Um, and, and they did a head to head comparison. Oh, I pardon the pun, I didn't mean that. They did a head to head comparison. They found that T cells in SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, were going into the brain but not even in cases of lethal flu, there were not T cells in the brain. So um, this is not going to be an inconsequential infection uh, as long as the SARS-CoV-2 you know, has these, these features. Um, so yeah, I think that's, was that the extent of what you asked? Yeah, no, I, th I think that was, that was very helpful. So uh, la last month, uh, Dr. Leonardo, you did a, a wide ranging uh, interview with uh, uh, Benjamin on the uh, WSWS. Uh, it was very well received and read by uh, thousands of our, our readers, uh, workers, young people uh, all over the world. Uh, in the interview, uh, you raised your concern um, about uh, long COVID. Uh, and uh, you also spoke at the uh, World Health Network Summit uh, recently. Um, and I think the, the remarks that you made were quite uh, striking. And I was wondering if maybe you could reiterate again, sort of uh, the findings of the uh, the study that you referred to on uh, rhesus macaques, um, and if, there, if you've seen any update on that, um, also the, the UK Biobank uh, study that you referred to, and then any other studies that you've been following. I know you wrote a paper yourself on uh, long COVID with uh, Dr. Gordasani, uh, but maybe, yeah, if you could speak on uh, sort of the broader uh, societal implications of long COVID, neurodegeneration, autoimmune disorders, um, so these, these issues, which I think many people are concerned about. And there's more awareness today about uh, long COVID than there, there had been, but we still have to really uh, develop that and stress the, uh, the severity of, of this disease. I agree. So, um, so long COVID as it stands, 
Um, I think, and it deserves this, it kind of deserves this classification or actually broad, broad classification. So if I were to try to define long COVID right now, I would be, I would be excluding a lot of people with, with a syndrome and problems that I haven't even conceived, haven't thought of. And here's, here's why that is. Because uh, SARS-CoV-2 is so, is so impactful on so many different uh, systems in the body, so many different physiological systems, um, there are going to be problems throughout. Um, so long COVID um, is something that is like a, a persistent sequelae or persistent issue from SARS-CoV-2 infection is going to be broad and it's, it's going to um, remain broad. And I think in the classification, it's going to have to follow, um, you know, just like, just like so many different tissues can have cancers and there are different type of, types of cancers. I think there are gonna be different types of long COVID as well. Um, so so we, can't, we can't really define it as one thing other than uh, post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 PASC. So I think, um, you know, I, I recently saw some very worrisome uh, uh, depictions of microclots um, in the blood of people with long COVID. So there is, there is a clotting issue that can arise. So the thing about the immune system and, and SARS-CoV-2 kind of turns the immune system haywire. It's able to um, cause T cells to downregulate FOXP3 and that's what prevents kind of autoimmunity in the T cells. Uh, that, I mean, that, that's, that's how T cells work to prevent autoimmunity in, in T cells called T regulatory T cells. So um, because these, because it can, create so much autoimmunity in so many different systems or, or inflammation, um, it's going to be, it's just going to be everywhere. And you, you mentioned uh, in your question about the rhesus macaque study, um, where all the rhesus macaques that were infected um, with very minimal disease uh, got Lewy bodies on autopsy or, or were revealed to have Lewy bodies. That's very concerning because the thing about, um, the thing about non-human primates is usually they recapitulate a disease process very well compared to mice. Um, and I know that in one study, there, there was a lot of um, inflammation in the brain in, in, humanized, uh, in, in mice with humanized ACE2, K18. Um, in their preprint in one study, they even saw some spongiosis, but when they, which, which are tiny little, you know, almost like tiny little holes on pathology. Um, when they dialed down the amount of virus they put in the mice uh, in their noses, they, they did not see that finding on the final publication, but it was with a dialed down amount of virus. Um, but that uh, obviously spongiosis was not seen in rhesus macaques and has not been seen in human brains. And Lewy bodies have also not been seen in human brains so far, but what they have seen according to the UK Biobank study, um, is a reduction in size in a number of places of the brain that are responsible for um, for things like memory and taste. Uh, so I can imagine there are going to be people that are, you know, are significantly affected by COVID-19 and by the infection uh, on the long term as well. We might have, I mean, we might have a generation of um, of people that need caretaking because they have a dementia or something. Uh, and, and we might have a generation of people that need organ replacement. I, I did see some data that saw, um, that saw kidney declines in long COVID, um, kidney function decline of what's called EGFR um, following SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, and I think it was, it was not even, it didn't even have to be severe disease in the people that had it. So it's, it's just going to cause inflammation and problems in so many different uh, physiological systems. And of course, the ones, you know, that some of the most um, worrisome physiological systems uh, that it could occur to would be, would be the brain and things, um, especially in terms of long-term disability. So uh, it, I can't, I can't, I can't deny anybody's, you know, long COVID experience. And I do know, you know, from, from a scientific standpoint, that it can be just so many different systems uh, 
just like cancer that that are probably going to have to be addressed and you know we're going to have to come up with a lot of science uh to see how to address it so it'll be a challenge dr leonardi um a follow-up question to this but you know just a comment is that um there are so many long covid clinics that are opening recruiting people um to participate um uh, in Michigan, Illinois, and various other states, um, it's just it's alarming that such a need is now becoming um, part of um, a big part of medicine right now. Um, yeah. In in the context of long COVID, uh, especially now that we're seeing so many breakthrough infections, and we're talking about reinfections, um, how does long COVID play with breakthrough infections? Um, um, Perhaps, you know, it's, it's important, you know, for people to understand that I, I think it's an important question. I agree. And um, it's, it's discouraging when I saw some data that um, suggested or a figure that suggested uh, that, that a breakthrough in a breakthrough infection in someone who was vaccinated, that it didn't necessarily confer protection from long COVID. Um, and I think that was a preprint that I saw. But uh, I can, it, it's, it's quite concerning, you know, that, um, that even though you're, you know, one is vaccinated and they might not have the acute severe uh, issues of SARS-CoV-2, they may go on to develop um, the long-term effects of infection, uh, like uh, decreased senses of uh, taste and smell, or, um, you know, some people are complaining of tachycardia or POTS. Uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and um, I think I think it's discouraging, and I think uh, yeah, it's it's kind of disappointing and worrisome. I I, I think um, I think it punctuates how important it is to wear masks and take precautions, even though you are vaccinated, um, because you you may be ending up with uh, some issue, and I I yeah I can't I I can't speculate too much, but it does concern me. Yeah, I very much uh, agree with that. And uh, I think, you know, just the, the whole issue of, uh, you know, of long COVID is, um, you know, incredibly uh, disturbing really for, you know, for society, uh, as you said, you know, it's uh, creating conditions where, you know, millions, if not, you know, billions of people worldwide could suffer, you know, long-term uh, debilitation. Uh, There's actually an article a couple of days ago uh, speculating that one of the major reasons there's such a labor shortage, which you alluded to um, earlier is the, uh, the fact that millions of uh, workers in the US are essentially unable to uh, return to work right now. Um, so it is, you know, it is really uh, horrific. And, um, you know, something it's, uh, I think there's a greater understanding um, in general. And, you know, I think the scientists on uh, Twitter in particular that, that promote this and the, the research that's been done has been very, uh, very critical, uh, but it is still something that's not really, um, you know, on the nightly, on the broadcast news, it's, it's not, it's maybe reported uh, once every couple months. Uh, and it's sort of um, not, I think it's, there's still a lack of understanding within the population about it, which we have to really remedy. Um, but I guess uh, just a, a final question. Uh, I know one of the other issues that uh, you raised in your interview with uh, with Benjamin was the uh, the issue of uh, mucosal vaccines and mucosal immunity, um, and I think that you know that is uh, something to be um, sort of hopeful about, or something to um, you know really I think there's a tremendous potential there to uh, uh, that that could be a major development in terms of the ability of, of humanity to fight the pandemic. So I was wondering if you could maybe speak to those issues uh, briefly, maybe briefly explain what mucosal immunity is, and then. Uh, if there's any developments that you've seen uh, recently with the research into mucosal uh, vaccines and sort of the implications of that uh, also for Omicron and the development of new variants. Okay, so thank you. So mucosal immunity is uh, very much desired for, um, for, for addressing this virus because of the way it transmits. So um, usually someone infected will, will cough or breathe even or sing or something and they'll, um, they'll exhale uh, uh, tiny fine particles that hang in the air for, for hours um, in aerosols. And so when, these, when, the, when you breathe in, um, it, it will, the virus will be able to contact 
the mucosal, what we call mucosal surfaces in your body. Um, and it will, it can, you know, penetrate in the lungs as well. So, um, so there's different, there's, there's, there are different um, types of antibodies, okay, um, in different types of immunity. So uh, we have systemic antibodies uh, like IgG, and these are induced, these are created when you give a vaccination um, intramuscularly, uh, and they'll, they'll circulate in your blood and they'll be able to kind of tag and opsonize, which means, you know, cover uh, the spike protein. Um, but there are also antibodies that are in your mucosa where, where in fact SARS-CoV-2 will first contact you. So when you're breathing in, um, you're breathing in air and the particulates that are in the air and they'll contact all your mucosal surfaces. So we have, we have immunity on those mucosal surfaces. They're, um, so most relevant are the IgA antibodies uh, that coat these mucosal surfaces. So um, if you only have IgG, you know, um, that's, well, the thing is the mRNA vaccines were shown to make a sort of IgA hybrid, like, a, like an IgG, uh, IgA um, that, is in, that is on mucosal surfaces. And that was Michal Tal's work um, out of MIT. And that's still a preprint as far as I know. Um, that's great, but it's it's not permanent and it doesn't last very long. It it kind of um, it, it kind of subsides after some time. So, if you if we have uh, a long term uh, or a longer term uh, IgA induced against SARS-CoV-2 that's able to coat our mucosal surfaces, it will better knock down the virus and prevent infection from occurring because the, the virus is going to first infect those uh, mucosal surfaces. So that, um, that's a goal for uh, many, many developing vaccines. I think, the, um, I think they started using uh, the Gamalaya or the uh, Sputnik vaccine um, intranasally. And so I'm not sure about that though, I'm not sure. So when you when you when you coat uh, a mucosal surface with a vaccine, uh, you can induce a localized response that will that should induce IgA production um, specific to SARS-CoV-2. So what that what what a specific uh, mucosal vaccine would do was would prevent you from getting infected, and basically when you don't get infected, you don't pass it on. So an IgA uh, so, so a vaccine that induces a mucosal protection should prevent um, onward transmission as well, um, you know, catching it and onwardly transmitting. So that's the best thing that one could hope for is prevention of infection with SARS-CoV-2, especially considering that uh, with a breakthrough case, you could get long COVID. Um, so recent developments in that, I have not been following closely, but, um, I, I do know uh, that it is a hot topic in vaccinology and immunology, and I'm, but I have not read anything um, promising or extensive about it that, that's come out uh, uh, since, since the time we spoke last time. Dr. Leonardi, just a quick follow-up to that one question. Is there a role for the combination of intramuscular and mucosal vaccines? I couldn't discount that actually. So um, that's a good that's a good question. That's a possible research question, and that may be what happens to all of us because we've all been given, uh, you know, an intramuscular jab, and we may eventually get uh, an inhaled or nasal vaccine. So um, there could be a role, definitely. Thank you so much. Excellent. Um, Benjamin, did you want to make a few remarks or should I uh, sum up? Um, just briefly, thank you, Evan, and thank you, Dr. Leonardi, for, um, uh, your, um, for your time. I mean, you, you uh, gave us a lot of your time in speaking about very complicated questions about a very complicated topic. Um, and I think it's very important for uh, listeners to have an understanding of these issues. Um, clearly, you know, uh, we're entering a very critical phase of the pandemic with the Omicron. And certainly, you know, there are offshoots of Omicron that are forming called the BA.2, which, you know, portend also additional concerns about 
uh, the future you know, of this pandemic. And as many have quoted, it's not even nearly you know, over. And I think uh, the strategy that uh, to eliminate the virus remains viable. Uh, and I think very important to not, I think these uh, vaccines, these uh, monoclonal antibodies, uh, these respirators are an improving ventilation, CO2 sensors are extremely critical and very important for the infrastructure and in fighting future pandemics. But we are in the middle of a pandemic where Delta is raging and Omicron is ominous, you know, in its threat. And I think right now, uh, the elimination strategy has to be considered viable by the working class. We really need to stop that. Um, and, and, and just to make one point, um, uh, we don't necessarily have to agree with you know, China's totalitarian policies, and we as internationalists have significant differences with China, for instance. But when we look at their, uh, their drive to um, do what they call a dynamic mitigation or elimination strategy, um, in 2021, they recorded two deaths in a country with a population of 1.4 billion. In that same time frame, the United States had 425,000 deaths with a population of 330 million. If we're, if we're going to speak about uh, saving population and improve population livelihood, I think uh, we have to really consider that elimination strategy must be a viable and important uh, public health option. And I, I will conclude with my remarks there. Yeah, th thank you, Benjamin. And uh, thank you, Dr. Leonardi. Um, thank you for participating in this and for really uh, presenting a comprehensive uh, overview of the, the science of uh, the Omicron variant and the, uh, you know, the dangers posed to society by the, uh, the unhindered spread of the, the pandemic. I think this has been a really important discussion uh, and really um, the points that have been brought out about the dangers of long COVID, uh, the impacts on children, uh, and really the, um, the potential for the Ex rapid exponential uh, spread of Omicron globally, I think, uh, are really critical, uh, and we have to really fight to, uh, you know, to bring this uh, understanding uh, into uh, into the population, into uh, the working class, in, in every country. These are the views of the the World Socialist website, and not necessarily uh, Dr. Leonardi, but we really advance uh, the call for uh, an international, globally coordinated effort. Uh, to eliminate uh, COVID-19 in every country, uh, and that if this were to be um, fought for uh, by masses of people and really developed into a, a popular movement, uh, that, it, that it is still possible. Uh, and what's really required is the utilization of every uh, tool that we have at our disposal uh, to stop the spread of the virus uh, and to treat those uh, who have been infected. Um, and, you know, just in terms of stopping viral transmission, there has to be a, a mass uh, public education uh, campaign to educate uh, society on the fact uh, which Dr. Leonardi has, and uh, uh, Benjamin and myself have spoken about throughout this meeting, but really the central uh, scientific fact that COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 uh, is an airborne uh, virus that spreads uh, through the air, uh, similar to smoke, uh, and that uh, the, the, uh, it's really essential uh, that everyone be provided with high quality uh, face masks of uh, N95 quality or better, N99, uh, P100 resp masks, uh, and elastomeric respirators uh, should all be, um, you know, produced uh, en masse and, and provided to the, the, uh, the global population. Uh, but then beyond that, really uh, developing filtration uh, systems, uh, uh, renovating filtration, improving ventilation uh, in every essential workplace. Uh, but really, given the severity of the crisis, uh, even during the uh, Delta surge, but now in particular with the threat of Omicron, uh, the WSWS does uh, advocate uh, for uh, that there needs to be lockdown measures and that we have to really close non-essential workplaces and schools uh, because it's, there's not enough time to renovate them to, to stop the spread of Omicron. Uh, and, you know, really, that's, those are the critical sources of viral transmission schools in particular. Uh, and there has to be uh, social supports provided to all workers uh, and small business people who are affected uh, by lockdowns. And that if they were done comprehensively and coordinated globally, they would, you know, not uh, need to last uh, more than a few months at most. And that's what we saw 
in the initial experience of China, which was then replicated by countries throughout the Asia Pacific region. Uh, and essentially, um, it's, it's, uh, it's really the only way to, to rapidly uh, bring an end to, to infections. And then this has to be combined with a, a program of mass testing, uh, systematic contact tracing, the isolation of infected patients, quarantining anyone that was potentially exposed, uh, and, um, and really uh, you know, developing um, the uh, healthcare systems, uh, which are you know, already in a state of uh, disrepair. They were in a state of disrepair before the pandemic. And now they've been really just completely uh, decimated by surge after surge of uh, the unhindered spread of the virus. Um, so that's, that's our, our, uh, our approach to the pandemic. And I would encourage everyone watching to uh, contact the WSWS to get involved uh, and to really um, develop this whole of society approach uh, and to, to stop the, uh, the needless uh, suffering and, and death uh, that has taken place and has likely killed over 12 million people, uh, according to the IHME already, uh, and threatens to kill many more uh, in the coming months. Um, and that really, uh, there has to be a unity of uh, a mass movement of the working class combined uh, with a, an understanding or educated uh, in a, with a scientific understanding of, of the elimination strategy and, and how it can be implemented. Um, so, Thank you, and uh, thank you again, Dr. Uh, Leonardi and uh, Benjamin, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, everyone.